This is a short overview of thromboelastography. This is a method used to test the efficiency of blood coagulation to monitor hemostasis. And it also gives you a hint as to the etiology of your blood clotting disorder, if any. Here's a small diagram that gives you a brief look at how it works. What you do is put a small amount of whole blood into this cup, and this cup rotates. You insert a pin into the blood, and as the blood clots, the pin will begin to deviate. You then measure the amplitude of those physical deviations across time, and you produce a plot that looks like this. Now this plot has many parameters, and those parameters are worth knowing because they are the ones that give you hints as to what your problem might be. The parameters can be remembered with the rule of sixes. <clears throat> the first parameter on here is the R time. This is the time to initial clot formation, so time from no amplitude deviation to the beginning of an amplitude deviation. This is usually about six minutes, and it represents the enzymatic time, also called the clot time, and it involves coagulation factors. The next parameter is the K time. <clears throat> this is the time from the initial clot formation to when you have about 20 millimeters in amplitude. So that 20 millimeter mark is shown with this line here, and the time from no amplitude to beginning of deviation to 20 millimeters is shown as the K time. The K time is the beginning of the polymerization phase, which involves clot kinetics. The polymerization phase ends with the maximum amplitude. That's shown up to here. The maximum amplitude is the maximum deviation of the tracing to baseline, and it's usually about 60 millimeters. If you were to draw a tangent line that intersects the tracing curve, as shown here, that angle is called the alpha angle, and this is the angle between the baseline at initial clot formation to the tangent line that you drew across your curve. That's usually about 60 degrees. The last parameter is the A30. This is the amplitude 30 minutes after reaching your maximum amplitude, and that's usually about 6%. So these are the parameters that are worth knowing. Now, uh, the last phase here is the thrombolysis phase. This involves clot stability and clot breakdown. And it's important to know the differences between this coagulation phase and this fibrinolysis phase, as it kind of also hints to the problems that might be causing your blood disorder. Now, a normal thromboelastography curve looks like this, also depicted here, with some variation. And this rule of sixes can help you remember the normal values for your parameters. If you have a hemodilution or clotting factor deficiency, you might have a delay in onset of coagulation, as shown in this curve here. The treatment for that would be fresh frozen plasma. If you have a fibrinogen deficiency, you might see a thromboelastography curve that looks like this, and the treatment for that would be cryoprecipitate. If your thromboelasticity um, curve looks like this, you might have low or dysfunctional platelets, and of course you want to replete those platelets. If your curve looks like this, you have a thrombosis problem. You can tell that the curve is not having any fibrinolysis. It's kind of reaching that maximal amplitude and staying there pretty steadily. So thrombosis is your problem. Your treatment is going to be anticoagulation. If you have a primary fibrinolysis, you might expect your curve to look like this, and you want to administer antifibrinolytics or tranexamic acid. If you have secondary fibrinolysis, your curve might look like this, and you want to treat the problem. It might be treating disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. I hope this overview of thromboelastography was helpful, and thank you for listening.